It's the start of the pandemic in 2020, and David Petrino is scrambling. He's the Director of Rehabilitation Innovation at the Mount Sinai Health System in New York, the city that's about to become the global COVID-19 hotspot. It was grim. We had a countdown for the number of days before we ran out of beds, you know, and that was something that we were just managing with my team while we were testing out clever ways of turning BiPAP machines into ventilators, building our own ventilators, building a remote patient monitoring app to track uh, acutely ill patients, chasing down PPE. David does what he can, but it's mostly distributing face masks and medications. The reality is doctors don't know much about COVID or how to fight it. The most they can do is try to prepare. I was meeting people on the street (laughs) who had boxes of 10, you know, N95s. And I was immediately rushing that off to whichever friend at whichever hospital needed it the most. There was just all sorts of crazy stuff going on in the early phase of the pandemic. The pandemic just gets worse and worse. Numbers continue to rise and every part of the healthcare system becomes strained. People were getting COVID symptoms, going to the hospital. They were being told, look, we don't have beds and you're not sick enough. Go home and come back if you're worse, which is a a really terrifying thing to say to someone who is sick with an unknown illness with an unknown disease course. Um, You know, how much sicker do? (laughs) At what point do I come back? So David and his colleagues start thinking about a way they can monitor COVID patients safely from their homes, and they settle on the idea of creating an app. My team has a lot of expertise in remote patient monitoring, so we developed an app in something like 24 to 36 hours, launched it. We said, here's a hotline. If you're having symptoms, call this number. The app prompts users to answer simple questions, like whether they have a fever or a cough. David says pretty soon hundreds and then thousands of patients are being monitored this way. Then around mid-April, a strange pattern emerges. We started seeing this cluster of people who were expressing different symptoms. Patients report diligently on the app. At first, they were predominantly complaining of headaches, fevers and shortness of breath, but suddenly their symptoms morph. Now they were talking about dizziness and fatigue and I can't seem to exercise the way I used to. And, you know, there's something about this that I can't shake. And my heart feels like it's beating out of its chest. And, you know, my arms are tingling. My feet are going blue. You know, all of these very odd symptoms. What was immediately striking to me was just how similar all of these, how random these accounts were, but really similar. David says what's also bizarre is that almost all of these patients were never hospitalized. A common narrative, in fact, is, yeah, I got it. I was fine. You know, I was more or less asymptomatic, Um, you know, and I didn't think there was anything to worry about. And then two weeks after my symptoms went away, I got hit with this. What David is describing heralds the start of his journey into trying to understand long COVID. He would go on to search for ways to help the millions of people across the world dealing with symptoms months after their coronavirus infection. Many patients are caught in a sort of medical purgatory, where their problems aren't understood, much less treated. And the advice they get is, well, not always reliable. If anyone tells you that they know what's going on, they're lying to you. (laughs) You know, like, don't trust that person. That's the one person you can't trust is the person who tells you categorically they know what's going on. And um, I've certainly seen a lot of clinicians doing that. As scientists rush to figure out the causes of long COVID, some health providers aren't waiting for answers. They're already finding ways to help patients now. I'm Jason Gale, Chief Biosecurity Correspondent and a Senior Editor at Bloomberg News. From the Prognosis Podcast, this is Breakthrough. They told my family, she's not going to make it. And so you need to come in and say your goodbyes. 
Kelly McCarthy caught a bad case of COVID back in February this year. Kelly is a 51-year-old grandmother from a town in Massachusetts about 20 miles southwest of Boston called Foxborough. Soon after falling ill, Kelly couldn't move. I couldn't even get out of bed. My husband's like, if I have to throw you over my shoulder, you're going to urgent care, which is good because when I got there, my oxygen was below 70, which I guess is bad. Kelly's condition deteriorated fast when she got sick. It got so bad that she had to be intubated and put into an induced coma. She couldn't breathe on her own. Eventually, she was given a tracheostomy so a tube could be inserted directly into her windpipe. But the prognosis was still grim, and doctors thought Kelly would need a double lung transplant. That wasn't needed in the end, and after two months in three hospitals, she was eventually released. But the second chapter of Kelly's COVID story was just beginning. Hospitals, medical tests and chronic disability have turned her world upside down. Kelly's main deficits are neurological. She can't feel her fingertips and she's suffering memory problems. Kelly's doctors are familiar with her symptoms, but she says it's not always so easy for long haulers to get good medical advice. I go over to the COVID clinic um, to meet with uh, all the people there because if you go to a regular doctor with, you know, this is the problem, they're going to look at it like a normal symptom of a normal thing. Kelly is referring to an outpatient clinic at the Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital in Boston. It's been four months since she was discharged and Kelly goes there for follow-up treatment. Today, she's sitting in the park across the street after seeing her doctor. Her recovery, she says, is still touch and go. Like today I'm having a good day. Yesterday and Saturday were terrible. I can't grasp the words I need. Um, I get confused when I'm saying it's almost like my brain's working way over time and my mouth isn't working nearly fast enough. The problem extends to her short-term recall and cognition. I forget things all the time. Like I'll look at one page and then I'll look to another page to put what it was I saw on this page, and I have to keep flipping back and forth several times. I've even been known to write it on my hand, so I don't have to keep flipping by. These are having a monumental impact on Kelly, who before COVID was an insurance claims adjuster, working out who owes what after an injury. And I've never been the poster girl for, for strong memory ever. But this is like this. This is what makes it difficult to go back to work because I have to know, I have to be on the money, so to speak. Um, because if I'm talking to an attorney about their client and their client's injuries and how much you know the whole big picture is worth and to negotiate, if I can't remember every little pod and peanut, then. It's going to be hard to, to negotiate with them. Oh, your, your client broke his leg? No, actually, they sprained their thumb, but okay. <laughs> you know, and I can't do that. One it's, one, it's embarrassing. Two, it's bad for the company to have people like that trying to settle claims. Three, it's embarrassing. Um, you know, so it's just like I, I can't do, and I hate to say this, I can't do anything important because I can't, I just can't yet. Kelly says her neurological issues also affect her driving. Get easily distracted and then I'll notice my car's going like this or I'll be walking and I'm shaking and that sort of goes into the car with me. I almost hit a car on the street the other day because I didn't even see it till I was right there and that's when I went home and went off the road today. The symptoms, too, can manifest at all hours. Another source of Kelly's distress is the difficulty she has sleeping. A lot of that has to do with the six weeks she spent in a drug-induced coma. Although heavily sedated, she was still able to connect with some aspects of being intubated in the ICU, but not make sense of them. And this delirium generates persistent nightmares. Awful, awful, awful nightmares. And not... Uh... But I wasn't so sedated that reality wasn't coming in. So, like, things were coming in from my reality, mixing into the dream and making it worse. Kelly says that early on, fear of these nightmares kept her from falling asleep. 
I was afraid I was going to have the dreams, and I was having the dreams that I was having in the coma. Now my dreams are, if I start having a weird dream, I'll wake up and I'll be beating on my husband. They're trying to put me in a coma again. No, they're not. They're not? No. Go to sleep. Okay. So I do, but it's a weird feeling. Think about this from the doctor's point of view. Your patients are coming to you with a slew of conditions that may not even seem related. Their short-term memory is failing, they're having horrible nightmares, they shake. It's hard to imagine where to start. For David Petrino, the starting point for understanding how to treat long COVID is the patient data coming in on his app. There's a pattern emerging that offers some clues. For instance, these long haulers share some common features. What we're seeing is a median age of 42. Um, About 70% of the patients who come to us are uh, women. So I'd say it's about 50-50 to people who had like some sort of significant medical history versus just fit and healthy and used to run marathons and keeps in good shape and all of these sorts of things. In the fall of 2020, David and his colleague, Dr. Zijian Chen, set up a rehabilitation service for COVID survivors at Mount Sinai. They call it the Centre for Post-COVID Care. But first, they need to figure out which patients will see which clinicians. So David says to his colleague, Hey, here's what we're going to do. If you're examining someone and they've got a bunch of symptoms and you can scan them, take their blood, look at their organs and say, this is the proximate cause of your symptoms. This is it. We, we know what this is um, and it's because of COVID, but we can see it. It's on a scan. You take them. If you have someone showing up with a laundry bag of symptoms and you can't see a single thing on their scan that would explain all of these symptoms, That, to me, is what we're going to call post-acute COVID syndrome, PACS. And that was was the term we we coined in April. And we said, we're we're calling it PACS, and they'll come to us, and off we go. Patients with medically explainable ailments are managed by pulmonologists, cardiologists, and other relevant specialists. But then there are the long haulers whose symptoms can't be easily explained. David knows their conditions fall under a broad umbrella of needs, so he brings together a team of doctors and allied health practitioners with different expertise. They work with him to come up with strategies to help manage their patients' specific problems. There's a cardiologist who specialises in how viruses affect the heart. There's a nutritionist who helps patients with food sensitivities. A couple of physiatrists. Um, These are medical doctors who treat pain. And there's a doctor of physical therapy. She is focused entirely on, you know, treating people who have post-concussion syndrome. Again, something that looks very, very similar. You've got um, heart palpitations. You've got difficulty with exercise and exertion. Then there's Josh Dunce, a formal naval special ops guy who disarmed bombs for a living. He tells David that some long COVID patients are displaying symptoms of something he'd seen in the military. It's called hypercapnia, which means a lack of carbon dioxide in the blood. It can be the result of deep or rapid breathing and can cause a tingling sensation in the limbs as well as abnormal heartbeat, muscle cramps and anxiety. So this, he'd seen this sort of symptom cluster before um and it had taken the form of hypercapnia in in you know fighter pilots who had pulled too many g's and were having a physiological response to that and um their co2 would drop they'd get heart palpitations they'd get dizziness they'd get these attacks josh tells david to test patients carbon dioxide levels sure enough a large proportion of our patients were hypercapnic Josh works on a breathing regimen to increase patient CO2 tolerance. It involves changing the duration of inhalations and exhalations with the net effect of expelling less carbon dioxide. David says he doesn't know the underlying cause of patient's hypercapnia, but the technique helps. Again, this leads back to pathophysiology and it's it's a bit of a blank slate. But 
we know that when we increase people's CO2 levels, an edge comes off of their symptoms in, in most cases. Figuring this out has given patients a way of controlling their symptoms. David says that if they feel an attack coming on, they can rein in these manifestations faster by focusing on their breathing for a couple of minutes. Psychologically, that's a big, big deal. You know, just being able to say, I have control over this, as opposed to, I almost fainted and I have no idea why. <laughs> you know, like that, that is a horrifying feeling to be somewhere public and feel like you're going to pass out and have no understanding of what's happening to your body. You don't want to go to the emergency department for the fifth time because you know they're just going to test everything they've already tested, give you an IV for hydration, and then send you on your way with probably a five grand bill. Pulling together a team of specialists with wide-ranging skills and knowledge is one thing, but getting these experts to work collectively to actually help long haulers is another. One of the first things David needs to figure out is how exactly he's going to offer the kind of coordinated holistic care patients need, and then he needs to work out how that's going to be delivered. Many of his patients are so debilitated that frequent face-to-face -face therapy sessions just aren't an option. What was alarming to me was how because the medical system is really hyper-specialized here, um, how many people would just be bounced from specialist to specialist without anyone offering a treatment or anyone offering a plan? And it was almost like a game, you know, oh, you got sent to me? No, 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 you've got GI symptoms. Go to, you know, here's the gastroenterologist. You get to the gastroenterologist. Oh, you got a headache? That's a neurology problem. Off you go to the neurologist. Patients typically have to wait three weeks for a specialty appointment. Many aren't working and their insurance is running out. And all of this is compounding their stress. Often by the time they made it to our clinic, they're so overwrought um, that it, it's, it's a miracle that they're still standing, let alone managing this highly debilitating condition. There are no established practices and protocols to follow with long COVID. Patients aren't fitting into neat boxes. David finds that you have to start with the basics. It's trial by error, and there are no guarantees of success. He says being up front and telling patients that from the outset is actually a source of comfort. Just being able to say, you know what, this is what we think is going on. And, and we would always lead with so much uncertainty. Like there was no, this is what's happening to you. It, it is, here's what we think is going on. It's an entirely novel virus. I can tell you that I've spoken to a thousand other people who have symptoms just like yours. Here's what we think is happening. And here's how we're going to manage a few things in the moment. And if these things don't work, come back to me because then we're going to try these things. It, it's really leading with vulnerability. But um, all of the patients that we saw would just would appreciate it so much to just be like, thank you. Thank you for not being overconfident. <laughs> thank you for not dismissing my symptoms. Thank you for taking a multi-system approach. David takes that same level of honesty into the two clinics he runs for long haulers in New York City. The centres are essentially big open rooms with various pieces of equipment. Ranging from, you know, robotic tilt tables um, that allow us to, you know, specifically calibrate exercise for the very, very severe cases, all the way out to treadmills for the people who are getting to the point where we can start pushing them. There are also devices for taking patient measurements, blood pressure cuffs, pulse oximeters, and instruments to check for hypercapnia. We've got uh, a set of things called Frenzel goggles, which allow us to measure the vestibular system, your balance system. That can identify autonomic nervous system problems occurring in patients when they go from sitting to standing, for example. The autonomic nervous system being this part of your nervous system that does all of the things that you usually don't need to think about, you know, when you should feel hot, when you should feel cold, when you should sweat, when your heart should beat, when you should breathe. And when that gets disordered, that's when all of these odd symptoms start to emerge. 
Changing body positions is often one of the biggest ways to stress the autonomic nervous system, David says. It's quite a challenging thing logistically to get all of the blood vessels to open and close and blood pressure to regulate as you're moving from sitting to standing. That's actually a really challenging thing to do that your body does automatically until a virus or something or some form of trauma knocks it out of balance and then all of a sudden it forgets how to do that. But rehab is a slow and often frustrating process that takes easily 100 days. We start with prehab, which is breath work. So, you know, first things first, we just make sure that everyone is working on just getting their blood gases in a place where they feel like they have their symptoms under control. David says that it sounds really basic, but changes to the way you breathe and the natural rhythm of your breath have different effects on the body. We heard about the technique for hypercapnia, but there are others. So, you know, there's one, one protocol, for instance, that is called box breathing, which is one of the fastest ways to regulate your parasympathetic nervous system. So it will bring your heart rate down, it will bring your blood pressure down, and it will do it quickly. Um, And so, you know, finding the right breathwork protocol for the right set of symptoms can sometimes be a bit of trial and error, but these things have measurable physiological effects and so they can be really powerful. After breathwork, patients move to the first step of the rehab program. In most cases, it involves lying flat on your back. So you're fully recumbent and we uh, just get gentle leg movements going. At this point, in most cases, um, our patients, aren't uh, their heart rate isn't stable enough for us to use heart rate as a guide. So we actually use a, a, a scale called the Borg scale, which allows you to rate perceived exertion, how hard you think you're working. And, you know, if you think of the scale of, you know, one to 10 where, well, zero to 10 where zero is nothing and, and 10 is maximal as hard as you could possibly think you're working um we don't let anyone exceed a two from there patients move slowly into a more upright position and the intensity gradually increases we get them to a point where we actually can use their heart rate as a guide their heart rate has started to regulate it's not racing all the time and ramping up and ramping down it's starting to regulate so we can now use it as a guide to you know um pace the exercise the way that we want to. We're now calling it exercise. David says that up until this point, the goal of the rehabilitation is to slowly condition the autonomic nervous system so it gets used to being challenged. What we're trying to do is just stress the body enough that the, that the body has to react. So your heart rate needs to raise up. Maybe you need to breathe slight you know slightly more your respiratory rate rate might increase by one breath per minute you know we're talking very little um your body temperature may change slightly but you're not really doing anything difficult the center tries to help patients within the limits of what their insurance will cover david says that usually means capping sessions at two a week if someone's quite severe it will be three times a week we try to do from home where possible because, um, you know, you just heard what I described, right? Laying flat on your back and moving your legs. All of that is blown out of the water if I'm asking you to leave your apartment and come see me in Manhattan. You know, like that's that's exertion. So, you know, we we do our absolute best to try to to reduce burden on the patient, both financial and, and physical. Somewhere around day 100, patients are typically able to work at 60 to 80% of their maximum heart rate. They're, you know, on a treadmill or a bike or whatever is comfortable for them and they're getting a workout. And that's usually the point where we're like, okay, well, these are all your triggers. These are the behaviors. These are the things to avoid. These are the things to encourage. Keep going with the exercise every day. There are graduates from the program, which is encouraging. I'd say we've, Uh, at this point, successfully discharged a few dozen, so probably 50 or 60, um, to the point where they're happy to move on, we're happy to let them go. Um, But then, yeah, there's a large number of people just still in ongoing rehab. 
But for some, their symptoms come back after months of treatment. And David says that raises questions about the long-term trajectory for long haulers. Some of our patients who have been discharged for the longest are experiencing relapses. So, you know, we need to understand the pathophysiology to understand how long is this going to be going on for? How long are people going to be symptomatic for? Is this something you have to manage for your entire life? Or is this something that you're going to have to manage for the next five to 10 years? Or is this something that we can rehabilitate and we'll discharge you and you'll never have to think about it again? So these are all open questions right now. Unlike asthma or diabetes, long COVID isn't a chronic disease doctors and researchers have known about and studied for decades. It's been around for just over a year and a half. There's not the accumulated wisdom of published medical studies to guide treatment. A lot of it, David says, is about learning from patients. So I remember, you know, very well thinking, wow, you know, this is someone who... Um, was told at some point that her family were told that she's not going to make it. You know, they were told that she might not come off the breathing machine. She might need you know, lung transplant at some point. This is Dr. Khaled Ismail. He's the medical director of the pulmonary division of the outpatient or ambulatory section where Kelly McCarthy is going for treatment. Khaled began seeing Kelly in the summer. At the start, he found it hard to match his new patient with her recent medical history. And here she is walking in clinic, you know, on her own feet uh, and uh, having a conversation with me. And she was in a, actually, a very cheerful mood. Much like David's work, Khalid describes his approach to helping Kelly as symptom management that's based on listening to the patient. For example, for her memory problems, Kelly sees a neurologist. They're taking images of her brain to look for anything else that could be affecting her. But Khalid says if they can't find an underlying cause, they have to use the tools available to them. We will probably uh, rely on things like uh, um, neurologic rehab, um, um, things that help with memory, memory exercises. But there's no telling whether memory exercises and other forms of neurological rehab will help. The fact is, there's still a lot of uncertainty around treating Kelly and patients like her. It's hard to know. Again, we don't know what's causing it, so it's hard to tell how long it's going to last. Kelly says she gets a lot of comfort from the care she receives at the Brigham and Women's COVID Recovery Centre, but the ambiguity of getting back to normal weighs on her. Is it ever going to be normal again? Am I ever going to be able to be me again? I don't feel like me. So, and I don't want to cry, but I don't feel like me anymore. It's taking things from me that are the most important to me, you know? Even as one pandemic of infectious disease rages on, another scourge is accumulating in its wake. Long COVID is leaving behind a mysterious, pernicious and ultimately unfathomable wave of chronic debilitating disease that may take years to understand. But treatments don't have to wait. That's it for this episode of Prognosis Breakthrough. On our next episode, Long COVID's legacy. We'll meet two best friends who together are navigating the persistent loss of smell and what it means for long haulers now and in the future. It's been a very, very fruitful friendship. And then obviously when I got the the very sad news that Alex was diagnosed with COVID, she uh, Facebook messaged me. I think the message said, bit of fun news, I have COVID. (laughs) You said, it'll be right. I said, you'll "You'll get it back. Inside I was panicking. This episode of Prognosis Breakthrough was written and reported by me, Jason Gale, with help from John Lowman. Topher Forhez is our senior producer. Carl Kevin Robinson Jr. is our associate producer. Our theme music was composed and performed by Hannes Brown. Rick Shine is our editor. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like this episode, please leave us a review. It helps others to find out about the show. Thanks for listening.